Welcome. Anybody here for the first time tonight? Welcome to you. Welcome back everyone else. Welcome to anybody tuning in for the first time online. I'm coming towards the end of a several month series. I'm sorry that I'm up there. This is supposed to be for the people at home to be able to see you guys, but it's not working. Um, several month series on the life of the Buddha, the core teachings of the Buddha. We're on the Eightfold Path. And um, we're on the seventh factor of the Eightfold Path, which is the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness. When I, I wasn't here last week because I was away teaching a retreat, but the week before uh, I started with the first foundation of mindfulness, which is present time awareness, the definition of mindfulness, awareness of uh, the physical body and using the physical body as what we're paying attention to being mindful of sensation, whether it's breath or posture or movement of the body. Tonight, we're gonna to move into the second foundation of mindfulness, which is feeling tone, the experience of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling sensations, perceptions of pleasure and pain and neutrality. So I'd like to ask you to um, reflect on your day. Um, how many pleasant experiences did you have today? Just reflecting, not reporting, just reflecting on your day. Like think of like five pleasant experiences that you had, sounds you heard, smells, smell anything pleasant today? Taste, do you taste anything pleasant today? pleasant sensations in your body. And now think of um, some unpleasant things you experienced today. Did you see anything unpleasant? Did you see something and you were just like, ooh, ouch, I don't wanna fucking look at that. Did you hear anything that it was like, you know, to you it was unpleasant, some unpleasant sounds? in the world, your environment? Do you smell anything gross today? Yeah. Unpleasant smells? How about taste? Did you put anything in your mouth today that you were like, ugh, this tea is not delicious? <laughs> Actually it is. How about pain? You fit any physical pain? You're about to have some physical pain in the meditation, so you have plenty to work with, probably. But just reflecting on pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. This is the topic for tonight's The Second Foundation. It is, I think in some ways, in my experience of Buddhism, it's the most transformative aspect of mindfulness. In the first foundation, we're learning to ignore our minds and pay attention to our bodies, and it's a lot of relief. Mindfulness of the breath, a lot of relief to ignore your mind, which is creating most of our suffering for us. But it's not that transformative to ignore. It's just ignorance. But to change our relationship to pain, we begin to develop compassion. To change our relationship to pleasure, we begin to experience letting go non-attachment and this is where the real liberation comes this is where buddhism is really directing us towards freedom in the midst of pain freedom in the midst of impermanent pleasure and learning to be bored i shouldn't give my whole dharma talk now <laughs> but as an intro so actually what i'd like to ask you to do is um meet with somebody i'll put you in at home i'm going to put you in the breakout rooms in here um, talk to, you know, turn towards somebody and, sh you know, share a couple of experiences that you had today that were pleasant. What happened? What was pleasant? And how'd you relate to it? How quickly was there like, oh, I want more of that clinging, craving. 
something unpleasant today? What was your relationship to your pain? You know, to share with your friend, you know, somebody that you're talking to, a stranger, someone you know, um, something painful. And, you know, like the big example I used to like to use all of the time is what happens when you stub your toe and you have that pain of an accidental injury? And how quickly do we meet it with hatred? I fucking hate you, pain, automatically, rather than learning to be soft and open and friendly towards our pain, which is what we're trying to do on the Buddhist path. So go ahead and start talking to each other at home. I'll throw you in some breakout rooms. So we'll have a period of meditation. Find a way to sit upright, relaxed. <coughs> Taking a moment to settle into the posture, finding the appropriate way to sit that's upright, with a mostly straight spine, upright, but also relaxed, not too rigid, not too tense. Breathing in, feel the sensations that the breath creates, breathing out releasing any tension that you can, softening the jaw, shoulders, belly. And internally establishing an attitude, uh, intention to be patient and kind and friendly towards whatever your mind does, whatever your body experiences. Beginning for the first couple of minutes in simple body awareness, mindfulness of the breath, breathing in, know that you're breathing in. Breathing out, know that you're breathing out. You get back into thinking about the future or the past. Gently return to the present here, sitting, meditating. Feel the breath, feel the body sitting upright.
mindfulness to the sound of the sirens. And investigate if it feels pleasant or unpleasant to hear the sirens as they pass, perhaps neutral. As we open to this second foundation of mindfulness and we use the mind to investigate what's happening, what we're feeling in the body, with the sense doors, the heart and mind. Moment to moment, identifying what is pleasant in our direct experience, perceived as enjoyable, even the subtly pleasant sensations, what is perceived as unpleasant, difficult to tolerate. Maybe even easy to tolerate, but still unpleasant, subtly annoying. You can start with the breath. If you're being mindful of the sensations of your breath, you just add this inquiry. Does my breath feel pleasant or unpleasant or neutral? Sensations of the air entering and exiting at the nostrils. You can take a wider perspective and investigate your posture as you sit here on the cushion, the chair, the contact with the seat that you're on is that contact, the sensations created by sitting, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. starting in the body with the first foundation, exploring the feeling tone, investigating. Search your physical experience for what is pleasant right now. What parts of the body feel comfortable, pleasurable? What part of the bodies begin to feel uncomfortable, painful? And how much of your physical body is neither pleasant nor unpleasant? Here in the room, the air conditioning turning on is a good opportunity to investigate how the feeling of the coolness coming into the room is perceived. Some will feel it as pleasant, perceive it. Some will begin to feel cold, perceive it as unpleasant.
Bring your awareness to seeing. What's experienced behind the closed eyes? Do you see shape, color, just darkness? I consciousness, awareness of seeing even behind the closed eyelids, some sense of awareness still there. And then ask yourself, is this eyes closed, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral? And then shift your mindfulness to hearing. And investigate the feeling tone of the sounds that are present now. My voice, the air conditioner, ambient sounds in the room or outside. Investigate sound. And then redirect your attention to the nose and mouth, smelling and tasting. What's your mouth taste like right now? Remnants of dinner, coffee. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Are there any smells? What's this room that you're sitting in smell like? Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. What's your mind feel like right now? Is there a pleasant mood in your mind? Is there an unpleasant? Anxiousness or worry can be pretty unpleasant. You can again scan your attention through your body, posture, how your hands are resting. Identifying what parts of the body feel pleasant, what parts of the body feel unpleasant. I notice that I'm often clenching my jaw unconsciously. And when I bring mindfulness to it, I become aware of how unpleasant that is. And then when I release it, how pleasant it is to relax the tension in my face. If you get drawn into thinking about something rather than stopping the thought, investigate. What kind of thought is this? Is it a pleasant thought? Is this a nice fantasy I got myself in? Some 
pleasant plan. Or is it unpleasant? Is the mind resenting or worrying? Each thought has a feeling tone to it as well. The first task is to become aware of what's happening and how it feels. We begin to meet the pain with more tolerance and acceptance. Mercy and compassion towards our own unpleasant experience. by softening your belly, your jaw, your heart, whatever's happening right now that's unpleasant as an act of compassion. And we learn to meet the pleasant experiences 
with an appreciation, learning to enjoy, while continuing to understand the impermanence of these experiences and let go. Non-attached appreciation over and over, letting go as you enjoy the arising and passing of the pleasant. We get more and more awareness of our relationship to neutrality. Our attention so quickly drawn to what's unpleasant, often ignoring that most of the body is comfortable. It's just that pain in the back or the knee that takes all of the attention. And you can kind of direct your attention to sound, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, to seeing, smelling, tasting, the physical sensations, the emotional experience and the mental activity. This human condition with these six sense doors constantly processing information and perceiving it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral.
How's the bell sound? Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? If you're attached to the continue meditating, you're like, fuck, it's over. If you're uncomfortable, you're like, oh, finally, pleasant, it's over. You get a sense, I mean, mean, many of you have been meditating for a long time and you know this material well. Um, But do you get a sense for those of you who are new or even if you've been of what we're being asked to do here on the second foundation? It can, it's quite difficult, especially if you don't have, if you haven't been meditating long or even if you have, depending on how, Uh, gathered your attention is right now to be able to actually focus and ident you know in on like okay what am I hearing and what what is the feeling tone of it and what am I feeling in my body and there's so many different sensations your toes feel so much different than your elbows it's like well my toes are comfortable but my lower back hurts and how the attention is so quickly drawn just to anything that feels like a threat. That, you know, survival instinct that is just interested in what's painful. I'm not really interested in the rest. You Knows how your mind does that? Looking for, is there anything wrong here? So it's quite difficult to start really seeing what is my relationship to neutrality? Because I'm never really very interested. The the mind, the untrained mind, isn't very interested in neutrality. It's only kind of scanning for threat or maybe craving for pleasure. Before I go into my lecture mode, any questions about the meditation instructions or how to uh, do this, how to work with this second level of mindfulness. And I want to say again, uh, my opinion is that um, this is probably the most transformational aspect of mindfulness. This is where the freedom from suffering, it really comes from this level of the practice, changing our relationship to pleasant and unpleasant and neutrality. Any questions out there? The room is dead silent. Any questions at home? Please. So is the goal to be neutral? Well, neutral is not, the way that we're talking about here, and sometimes the way it's translated is perceiving sensation, experience, phenomena, your perception of it is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So I use the term neutral for neither pleasant nor unpleasant which is different than the way we tend to like neutral is like, um, I don't have an opinion or, you know, I'm neutral in the situation or like a neutral relationship to pain. Is that what you mean? Like, are we supposed to get neutral in our, it's semantics, but we could say that the goal is to be at ease, not neutral. You're feeling the pain that is here to be felt, but you're, accepting of it. You're at ease with it. Um, You're feeling the pleasure. You're knowing that it's impermanent. You're enjoying the shit out of it, whatever it is, the pleasant experience. But being at, you know, how often do we turn our pleasure into suffering because we're so attached to it, not passing, not being impermanent, being at ease with the impermanence of the pleasure and being at ease with the uh, impermanence of the pain, but the presently impermanent pain. So the goal is peace, right? Peace, man. To be at peace, I like the term ease better than peace, but peace works to be at peace with your experience rather than at war with your experience, even when it's painful. Is the goal 
This is what we're trying to learn how to do. That is what will end suffering, right? There's pain. And then the resistance is the suffering. There's pleasure. And then the clinging is the suffering. Neutrality, do you suffer about neutrality? It's usually around pleasure and pain that we suffer, but neutrality, often we go uh, looking for pleasure. Yeah, it's sort of what we call boredom. You're just a little too comfortable and not quite tolerant of comfort and neutrality. So the mind goes looking for something pleasant to cling to, to crave for. Maybe you remember some of you were here to backtrack a little bit on this teaching, the Buddha's teaching on the Eightfold Path, how to awaken, how to get free. The first factor of the Eightfold Path, the Buddha talks about um, karma, understanding total personal responsibility, and he also talks about dependent origination. In order to free ourselves from suffering, we have to understand that all of our suffering is dependent on the causes and conditions that preceded it. And so part of the causes and conditions for us here as, as human beings is that first of all, you took birth. <laughs> it starts at birth, you took birth and you took birth into a body that has these six sense doors hearing and seeing and smelling and tasting and thinking, feeling. It has consciousness. You're aware. You have the potential to be aware, to be awake, to be conscious. We're always conscious of something. But so often we're running a sort of unconscious, self-centered life. But consciousness is here. And perception. And a lot of what we're doing in this meditation is what is my perception? Am I perceiving this as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Mm -hmm. And then there's the six sense doors that come into contact with experience. There's eye consciousness, and then there's what the eye sees. And I know I've already said this, but I'm going to keep saying it. Every single thing that we see right now, seeing me, seeing the screen, seeing the art, whatever you're looking at right now, your shoes, your socks, your environment, the mind is saying that's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral to look at. You might not be aware of that, but everything that comes into your vision all day, every day, the mind is perceiving as pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Everything that the ears, there's awareness, there's consciousness, everything that we hear. And it's not like the mind tells you, oh, by the way, isn't this a pleasant sound? It's all a kind of unconscious. It's just like uh, so a kind of liking, disliking, liking, disliking, liking, disliking. Every smell, every taste, every sensation, every emotion, every thought. And the thought world is so, because your mind just does whatever the fuck it wants all the time. Sometimes you're very intentionally investigating, analyzing, thinking about something, making a plan, reflecting on some important experience in the past. But how much of the time are you really intentional about what you're thinking about? And how much of the time is your mind just running the show? The more you meditate, the more you start to see like, oh, most of the time my mind's doing whatever the fuck it wants. And I'm just going along for the ride. I wasn't really meaning to spend the last hour worried. I wasn't really meaning to spend the last, you know, half of the day in fantasy about some future outcome. That's what my mind was doing. And I was just going with it. You get this, right? Now, I think it gets trickier because 
again, it's very much in the dependent origination. It's what is your perception of the phenomena that's meeting your mind, your body, your sense doors. And it's very personal in this way because we could all have the, like we could put on the same music. We're all hearing the same thing. Like right now with the air conditioning on in this room, it's the same temperature for all of us. And some of you are comfortable. Like, yeah, that's about right, neutral. Some of you are cold, unpleasant, need a fucking blanket. What, what are you freezing us? And some of you are still hot. So personal, you know, it's like food. You bring out a plate of something, fruit. <laughs> and some of us will be like, oh, I love delicious. Fucking apples are delicious. And some of you be like, oh, apples are disgusting. The mealiness in my mouth makes me want to puke. Even the crisp ones are gross. So, you know, so really waking up to total personal responsibility for our perception of what we're experiencing rather than, you know, how often you've been in that um, self-centered stance about like, well, what I like is good, <laughs> is pleasant. Apples really are delicious. And anybody that doesn't like apples is an idiot. How could you not that you, know, you experience that as unpleasant and that judgmental rather than just my perception is this is pleasant. I think, uh, you know, a bigger interesting part of the investigation because Buddhism is kind of making this argument that um, if it's pleasant, you're probably going to get attached to it. If it's unpleasant, you're probably going to be aversive to it. That that's the, in the dependent origination, there's contact with pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and then an unconscious reaction of aversion to pain and clinging to pleasure and some level of ignoring neutrality. This feels a little complicated to me by the fact that um, on some level or another, some painful phenomena you might actually find pleasant. So it's not, it's painful and it's, and I'm averse to it. You, you know, many of us have quite a taste for the right kind of pain. For instance, your relationship to spicy food. Some of us love it when our mouth is on fire painful, you know, burning sensations. And I'm like, oh, this is great. This hurts so much. I love it. Because that's what spicy, you know, that's what spice is. It's pain receptors in the mouth and the body, but we experience it as pleasant. But someone else, you give them just a little bit of spice and their relationship to it is this is in, this is painful there's nothing pleasant about uh, ghost peppers at all it's all pain i like this this helps kind of personalize the practice into it's it's not what's happening it's my perception of what's happening and that over uh arching truth of, of reality, of truth of Buddhism, which is that our happiness or unhappiness isn't about what we're experiencing. It's not about the pleasure or the pain that we're experiencing. It's about how we're relating to it. This may, you know, do you know this? So this is one of the reasons why we focus so much on the second foundation and changing our relationship because the default is clinging and aversion. In the meditation, we bring our attention in and we start to increase our awareness of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, bring it onto the radar, bring a, oh, my eye is constantly doing that, my ears, my nose, my tongue. And, you know, kind of breaking it down a little bit from, that tendency that I think most of us have 
to just say, I don't like this, or I do like that, or I'm suffering about this and kind of say like, oh, it's just what my eyes are experiencing or just what the ears are experiencing or my body's uncomfortable, but it's really pleasant music. <laughs> my knees hurt, but um, my shoulders are totally relaxed. And seeing that all of these different things are happening simultaneously. And where are we giving our attention? Ultimately, all of it comes back to the development or the uncovering of compassion and non-attachment. The solution is to, to be at ease. Compassion leads to ease with pain. It's one of the great things about doing sitting meditation. Did your body get a little uncomfortable tonight? experience some unpleasant sensations? I hope you did. <laughs> Not just because I'm a sadist, but I actually hope because it's beneficial for us to intentionally be uncomfortable. So we have this opportunity to change our relationship to discomfort. If you have a spiritual practice or a tendency to only go towards where it's like easy and comfortable and pleasant, uh, then you'll never have the opportunity to develop compassion. And if you can start to reframe your whole life like this, that every time something unpleasant is happening, it becomes an opportunity for trying to be compassionate, for tolerating it, for increasing your tolerance towards whatever is unpleasant. So in meditation, we do this intentional, I'm gonna put myself in this posture that's going to be you know, hopefully stable and comfortable in the beginning, but it's gonna get uncomfortable. If you sit here long enough, your ass is gonna to start to hurt. Naturally, the body was gonna to start to say like, oh, this is unpleasant. Tibetan Buddhists have a practice um, and it's like a prayer, like an aspiration, like an in, in a daily intention where they ask for, they say, may I be met with the appropriate difficulties today so that I have the opportunity to respond with compassion. It's like praying for pain. What a different frame than us, which like unconsciously are saying like, I hope nothing difficult happens ever. I really hope that everything just goes my way and is pleasant. And I don't want any difficulty. I don't, no opportunities for me, please. And reframing it to like, I want to be, you, I want to be free from suffering. I know that in order to be free from suffering, I have to develop compassion. So now every unpleasant sound, smell, taste, sensation, emotion, thought that arises in my mind that's unpleasant is an opportunity. Can I meet this with, with a bit more kindness, with a bit more mercy, with some forgiveness, with some compassion? And sometimes the, you know, like I, the way I say it, can I? Sometimes the answer is nope. <laughs> And it's, it's sort of a, um, not yet. I can't yet. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at tolerance. I'm not good at compassion. I don't have that skill very well uh, honed yet, but I'm going to keep trying. And that humility of failure of like, I'm trying to be compassionate. I'm, it's not happening yet, but I'm going to keep trying to be compassionate towards this unpleasantness, whatever it is. That's the orientation of the Dharma, compassion for pain. And many of you have heard me say it. I have this image of like a compassion gauge, an internal, like somewhere in your being, there's like this compassion gauge. And then on some level or another for human beings, that dependent origination, that the default is like empty empty of self-compassion. 
We're not born into a nervous system that is very relaxed around our own pain, that is very compassionate around. Our survival instinct dictates aversion to pain. So it's one of the reasons why what we're doing is so radical. The Buddha's teachings is so counter to our survival instincts. Survival instincts hate pain, survive, be stressed out, be unhappy, don't die. <laughs> Buddhism says, actually, let's do this differently. Let's not be stressed out. Let's learn to not hate pain. Let's learn to have wisdom towards our pain and not be stressed so stressed out and unhappy and to learn to be at ease in the midst of the unavoidable discomforts of the human condition these sense doors, this mind, this heart. So we're, you know, we have this internal, we start on empty. When you start meditating and you're like, I fucking hate pain. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable and I hate this. In my mind, I hate it. And, you know, all, all of the unpleasantness. And, and then it starts to, over the months and years of your meditation practice, you start to see, oh, I'm much more relaxed around pain now that I've been meditating regularly and turning towards it. And not only in our sitting meditation, but in our daily life. Like I'm stuck in traffic rather than raging. Oh, this is an opportunity for patience. Something unpleasant, you know, I use the uh, example earlier of when you accidentally hurt yourself. We do some of that intentionally in sitting meditation, but when you stub your toe or you slam your hand in the door or you burn yourself cooking or curling your hair or something and some sensation, I'm curling my hair often, you know, <laughs> some unpleasant sensation. And immediately you see that aversive ouch and I hate this. And then you, the Dharma reminds us, oh, what if I relax into it? What if I use this as a practice for having some compassion towards my poor throbbing toe that I just jammed? So not just on the meditation cushion, but throughout our days, when you're in that difficult, maybe some conflict with someone and using that as an opportunity. Can I be more patient, more tolerant, more compassionate? And the gauge starts to shift. And my experience is that it shifts gradually over the decades of meditation from empty to more and more ability to actually be tolerant and patient and kind. The other gauge that we have and the other maybe kind of half of the practice is non-attachment. And we're born again into a system with a gauge on empty when it comes to non-attachment. Any of you very good at non-attachment, <laughs> non-clinging? Maybe if you've been practicing for a while, I mean, some, some people... Um, are detached and dissociated and it, you know, kind of looks like non-attachment, but it's just checked out. That's not the same thing. So now if we really start to live the second foundation of mindfulness, pleasant, unpleasant, when I'm turning towards and experiencing pleasure, remembering it's impermanent, it's arising, it's sustaining, it's passing, trying to let go, enjoy and let go, enjoy and let go, enjoy and let go, and not just avoid. You know, sometimes you start to understand, oh man, I've suffered so much about my craving for pleasure, my attachment to pleasure, my clinging, um, that when then we kind of get this aversive, like, well, I better avoid pleasure. Pleasure is dangerous. And it's true. Like so many of us are addicts, recovering addicts. And our relationship to pleasure is, it can be dangerous because we'll push the pleasure button, you know, that, like that study of the rats and the whatever it was, cocaine or crack or sugar or whatever it was. And like, they'll, you know, we'll push it over and over until it fucking kills us. 
and waking up to like, I have to change my relationship. I have to renounce certain types of pleasant intoxicated states. And then with the, you know, non drug induced pleasant experiences, I have to bring a lot of awareness to how attached, how much craving, how I'll find something pleasant and I'll just do it over and over and over and over and I'll fucking burn it out. Whether it becomes another addiction or you're just eating ice cream every day and that becomes the new addiction or, or um, whatever repetitive cycle we can get in around avoiding pain and creating pleasure clinging to it, craving for it, habitual. So in the Dharma, on the meditative, the Buddhist path, non-attachment. Each pleasant experience and opportunity, or that's a very pleasant sound, enjoy it and let it pass. Notice the arising and the passing of that pleasant sound. It's really a pleasant image. Uh, you know, I really like that art or that beat, you know, the beach. I love it. It's so pleasant to be at the beach, but I'm not, I don't get to live on the beach. I don't get to see the ocean every minute of the day. I still have to go to work. So enjoying the time that you get with it, but it's unpleasant. I mean, but it's impermanent. Cherishing the impermanence, non-attached appreciation. And that gauge starts to shift and you get better at letting go. Enjoying and letting go. I would say on some level, there's three, if you're interested in freeing yourself from suffering, there's three things you're going to have to do. We are all going to have to do. Compassion, non-attachment. And the third one, which isn't a really the topic tonight, but I got to throw it in because I can't just say non-clinging and compassion. The third one is uh, learn to, that this whole thing isn't as personal as we've been taking it. We have to break our self-centeredness. And some of that stuff around uh, our views and opinions around what's pleasant and what's unpleasant and what, what music is good and what music is terrible, you know, like that's such a, so much self-centeredness and like my perception, my taste is the truth rather than just, that's oh, just my conditioning. My conditioning is loud, fast music is pleasant. <laughs> Other people's conditioning is loud, fast music makes their ears bleed. And not one is good and one is right and one is wrong, but just that relaxed, non-self-centered, knowing these are just my views and opinions. This is just my perception. I love the Buddha's in the suttas anyways, it said that the Buddha um, often uh, referred to people that don't meditate, that don't bring this kind of awareness to pleasure and pain and self-centeredness. He said, these untrained worldlings, the people that don't have any wisdom, they've never trained their mind to have wisdom. Untrained worldlings that go around annoying each other with their views and opinions. And so obvious to look at the world and all of the separation and all of the conflict of people that just aren't coming from wisdom and are just annoying each other, fighting each other, judging each other based on views and opinions that are not very well informed, that certainly aren't informed by compassion, non-attachment, and the impersonal nature of this human condition, the universal nature of this human condition, that we're all in it together. And on some level or another, we all cling to pleasure and we all hate pain. And and here we are trying our best to transform our relationship to it so we don't suffer so much. 
so we can have more peace, more ease, more freedom in the midst of the reality of the impermanent truth that it's a whole bunch of painful experiences that you experience every day. That's why I started with uh, reflect on your day, pain, painful smells and tastes and images and thoughts and sensations all day, every day, unavoidable. Also pleasure, unavoidable, pleasant sounds and smells and tastes and sensations and emotions and thoughts. Hopefully every day you're getting some mixture of the 10,000 pleasant experiences and the 10,000 unpleasant experiences. And I'll leave it there for now. Any questions, comments about how to do this, live it, practice it? At home, you can raise your hand in the reactions button, please. And like one thing that caught my attention, just kind of like a comment was the unpleasant, pleasant or neutral. And I'm like, is that true? So I started thinking about it. I'm like, if I'm just like walking through the day and it's like, it seems to me like, in, in, like once I bring attention to something, then it's sort of when I assign the value of being pleasant or unpleasant, which is like, it's purely subjective. And so and then I'm like, well, no, maybe I am assigning it pleasant, unpleasant subconsciously, or but it seems like whenever I assign it, it's because I brought awareness to it, or at least I'm aware of it being unpleasant or unpleasant, um, w- which is interesting because it's all subjective. And then that kind of can like, like you're saying with like music, it's like I started to think of how my taste in music has changed a lot over the years because I used to only listen to like really angry like music and then over the years i listen to more calm music and that's more pleasant to me now um which is subjective yeah and um the, i i like what you're saying and of course it's subjective but also there's a part of this that subjective sounds a little bit like we have choice And part of what I think the Buddha is saying here is that it's happening, your perception, you're not choosing, I think I will enjoy this, or I think I will not enjoy this. It's happening all by itself. It's the conditionings of our life that create these subjective uh, responses, but that, and as we transform also, all of a sudden, like you could like music that you used to hate. Or you hate music that you used to like, but it's not like you're choosing that. Your nervous system has just sort of changed. Your perception has just sort of changed. And that's part of what can help us wake up to the impersonal. Subjective sounds like we can um, kind of control it and, and choose. I choose to like this. Try to like something that you don't like. (laughs) It's just unpleasant until there's something in you that just shifts and says, oh, actually now this is okay. And we bring our awareness in and and it's happening without the second foundation, it's happening completely unconsciously. The more we bring awareness to it, the more we can start to start to influence our relationship to changing how we respond to pain and pleasure and, but I don't know that we can change what we like and dislike, what those preferences are, what those, that seems to just sort of start to shift all by itself. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Yeah. And lastly, can I just say yeah. something that's like also been so important too, was, is, um, which I love about this teaching is that you're, it is, um, what was I just gonna say, sorry. Um, Oh, turning towards, like the, you know, changing our relationship to it. Because when I first started meditation, and I don't know if this helps anyone, I, I thought it was like you talk about it. I'm just looking for Zen. You know, I'm looking for five minutes of Zen just to check out, and it works and it feels good. Um, but I, <laughs> I don't know how long I've been meditating, maybe three, four years. I 
just learned that I tend to use meditation as a avoidance thing. And it's not the teaching that, as far as I know, Buddhism. Yeah. And I've had to learn that it's like it is turning towards. Yeah. And it's not to avoid. In fact, it's the complete opposite. And so still, you know, four years, that's like been my main like struggle with this. Yeah. So, but it's good news. It's good news. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that, you know, most of you know most of us would admit that same bias towards meditation where you come in and you're like i want meditation to feel good and i want to zen out i want to check out and i want to temporarily avoid and then it's but that's not what the buddha's teaching is and it's why the buddha said this is against the stream because everybody wants to do that i want to avoid this shit. i don't want to feel my sorrow i want to avoid it i don't want to feel my pain i want to meditate it away and then you come to early buddhism where it's saying like learn to just be really fucking uncomfortable <laughs> and non-reactive and compassionate towards it so much harder but also as you're saying so much more transformative I take a question online casey you still yeah unmute yourself and go for it you know, uh, um, so my question is actually goes really well with the last one. Um, last week with uh, with Jason, we were talking about um, body mindfulness, and he had us do this meditation exercise where we paid attention to one part of our body at a time through sort of a cycle. Um, and uh, I actually was doing that today a little bit as well to try and maintain my grounding um and that body mindfulness and my question is with the aversion and the clinging um what is do you have any suggestions like for in meditation what are some what's an approach to to look at those things without sort of spiraling spiraling off into plans and because that's like for me, I'm a little bit new to this and it's, it's once I start going down those roads of thinking about what makes me happy and what makes me angry or sad or upset, um, it's really easy to like sort of become unmoored a little bit and, and, and drift off. Um, so yeah, um, let's, on a practical level, like what's, what's a way to sort of stay centered? On a, could everybody in the room here? Yeah, question. Um, on a practical level, um, Casey, it's impossible to stay. <laughs> yeah. So just, you know, like let, let go of that craving and clinging to stay. Your mind right. is going to take a long time to be trained enough, to be tamed enough to really stay and investigate. Mm -hmm. So have the, you know, so approach it with like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not that great at it yet. I'm going to keep returning to that body part that I'm focusing on, to the breath, the sensation, whatever part you're, my practice isn't going to be staying. It's going to be consistently returning because the reality is the attention is going to wander and then it's going to come back. It's going to wander and then we're going to bring it back. It's going to wander and then we're going to bring it back. So just orient your whole practice. And this is not just for Casey, it's for all of us. Let go of the idea that you're going to perfectly concentrate all of your attention where you want it to. And it's not going to get back into the planning, remembering, hoping, fearing tendency of mind. That shit's going to happen over and over forever. <laughs> <laughs> and you're and it's going to decrease and you're going to get more stabilized and over the years of your practice and the retreats that you'll do and and you'll you'll see like oh in 5 years from now I'm a bit better at it and 10 years from now a bit more settled and a bit more ability to choose where I'm placing my attention and 15 and 20 like really think about this in like decades and half decades of improving and the those um gauges that I was talking about, you know, kind of, I'm not going to be able to be compassionate all the time right now, but in the next couple of years, if I can just move it a little bit and then, you know, a little bit more and 
so I hope that helps and not isn't too disillusioning. But um, my, my, it's been my experience with the Dharma is that it really are slowly gradual awakening. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Maybe we'll leave it there for tonight. Good to see everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, try to, uh, you know, reframe your whole life. Pleasant as an opportunity <laughs> for letting go. Unpleasant as an opportunity for compassion. And um, we'll start to move those internal dials towards more freedom. Um, announcement that I have, one is classes done by donation against the stream is a nonprofit uh, Buddhist organization that is supported by your generosity. Everybody's welcome here, regardless of ability to donate, but we have, you know, expensive rent and, and some employee costs and, you know, to, to do all of this. So please be as generous as you can. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter of Against the Stream, where you say, I want to just, you know, give 25 or 50 or $100 a month to support the organization. Or when you drop into class, if you're on Zoom, please click through and, and make a donation to support the organization and to support me and my teachings. If you're here, you can make a donation in the bowl or you, there's the Venmo um, QR code over there if you want to make a, a Venmo or PayPal donation. Um, the Memorial Day against the stream, I'm teaching a three-day silent Buddhist meditation retreat. Um, it's in, I guess it's in four weeks. Um, Memorial Day weekend's coming up. We're already in fucking May. Here we are. And um, there's still room. So if you are thinking about coming, sign up, come sit for the weekend. Uh, you will um, move the dial a little bit more in doing a few days of retreat practice I just came back. I was teaching a seven day retreat in New Mexico for the last week. I got home today and, um, you know, we're sitting eight times a day. We're walking eight times a day. So like every day you're getting more practice than you probably usually do in a week. Maybe, you know, I don't know if you, how much math you can do here. Um, but maybe you're getting like two weeks of practice with the sitting practice and the walking practice and the per day. So like this three day retreat, you're getting like a month worth of Dharma download. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know exactly. It doesn't really work like that, but I'm just saying it's a really great thing to do. Come to the retreat if you can. It's pretty full, but there is some room still. So try to try to join us for the Memorial Day retreat. Um, and then I won't have another against the stream retreat until the fall. So it's May and then October, there'll be a seven day, we'll have a week long retreat in the fall for Against the Stream. I think that's it. I'll see you next Monday. Hope you come back. Many goodness that uh, is developed through our practice be gathered and shared outward in all directions with all beings. May each of us get as free as possible. And together, may we create a positive change on this planet. <laughs>